If you're new to the work of the Trinity Forum, we seek to provide a space and resources to engage life's biggest questions in the context of faith and do that by providing programs such as our online conversation today to do exactly that and to come to better know the author of the answers. And it seems an especially fitting time to discuss story, culture, and the common good when our shared sense of the common good is challenged, our common culture increasingly marked by divisiveness, anger, and alienation, and many of our public conversations tarnished by snark and by ugliness. But in many ways, the writings and works of our guest today stand as a powerful and poetic challenge to this fractiousness and offer an illumination of the beauty of the ordinary and fallen world. They stand as a summons to think more deeply, see more charitably, and accept the invitation to wonder, mystery, and grace. Marilyn Robinson is a novelist, essayist, and teacher, one of the most renowned and revered of living writers. Her novels, Housekeeping, Gilead, Lila, and Home, have been variously honored with a Pulitzer Prize, National Books Critics Circle Award twice, a Hemingway Foundation Award, an Orange Prize, the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction, and the Ambassador Book Award. She's also the author of many essays and nonfiction works, including just a few of them, her, her work Mother Country and her essay collections, Death of Adam, Absence of Mind, When I Was a Child, I Read Books, The Givenness of Things, and What Are We Doing Here? She's the recipient of the National Humanities Medal and an elected fellow of the American Academy in Arts and Sciences. And in addition to her writing, has spent over 20 years teaching at the Iowa Writers Groups, as, with, as well as several universities. Due to technical difficulties, she'll be joining us by phone and video. Marilyn, it is a delight to have you here. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm sorry that I seem to have been a large part of the technical problem, but that's just, you know, that's my nature. It keeps one humble. We're, we're thrilled to have you in any capacity, Marilyn. You have an upcoming novel that I know is much anticipated. Jack will be out in less than two months. What can you tell us about your new novel? Well, uh, you know, it's about the character Jack Bowden, who appears in, in earlier novels. Um, his voice or the th the sense of him was just very much on my mind. And I wrote the book in a way feeling that I was completing, completing the quartet of books at this point. Um, I don't know really, <laughs> you know, I don't really know why I wrote, write novels. I have a novel on my mind and I write it and that's about it, you know, there's a question always, uh, or, a, or a set of questions, a complex of questions that uh, always accompany any, any writing that I do, and it was true for Jack also. It seems that one of your recurring themes of your work are be is beauty. Uh, there's really an element of both reveling in and revealing the beautiful that seems to characterize so many of your novels. Uh, but you recently wrote in an essay that I'm gonna quote, beauty as a conscious element of experience as a thing to be valued and explored has gone into abeyance among us. Why do you believe that the exploration of beauty has gone into abeyance and what have we lost as a result? Um, I think that my, my thinking about that actually was a response to teaching literature to writers and having them tell me that, um, that it, when I talked about something wonderful like in Moby Dick or something as beautiful, it's the first time that they had heard beautiful applied to literature, which is just stunning, you know, just amazing. Here, here it is, the you know, the great prevailing with, um, art of our period. And uh, I, I just couldn't believe that the way that literature is talked about had become so, so deeply a kind of form of sociology and so on that uh, aesthetic categories were dismissed in, in discussing it. I think that um, you find in any good writer that 
beautiful language is, is arising. <laughs> it's something that is done for emphasis. It is something that indicates that a, a kind of degree of focus has been made, achieved. Um, and I don't think that you can read good literature successfully if you exclude the beautiful as a, a consideration always active in good writing. Yeah, so much of what is beautiful does um, depend on our perception. And you have um, probably one of your most beloved characters, John Ames, say that whenever you turn your eyes, the world can shine like transfiguration. You don't have to bring a thing to it except a willingness to see. And you've said similar things in your own voice as well as your character's voice, which I am betting evokes no small amount of wistfulness in many of your, your friends, fans, and readers who would deeply like to see the same luminous beauty that you do. How does one learn to see? By looking, basically, you know. I mean, there's a way, I mean, I, I consider the primary, primary privilege of being a human being is a sort of universal privilege of being able to uh, watch light fall on things, you know, watch vegetation live in the world in the complicated ways that it does and so on. All these things, the shimmer, the effulgence, all these things um, are you know, simply there to be seen, whether or not people choose to look at them, whether they relegate too many things to the category of ordinary or meaningless, that's the original choice. But if you are interested in the nature of the experience of life on this planet, then very quickly all sorts of things begin to present themselves to you as, as mysteriously beautiful, um, discovered beauty, not no rarification or falsification, but the thing itself, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd love to ask you about your characters. You once noted that after you finish writing a novel, you miss them. Uh, you feel bereaved, I think, is the word you use. Mm -hmm. And you also noted that the characters that interest you the most are the ones that, sh that pose questions to your thinking and that you can learn from. So I was curious whether you still hear their voices at times, even after a novel is finished, and what you've learned from your characters in telling their story. I do sometimes uh, know that a phrase that runs through my mind <laughs> could be attributed to one of my characters. I almost feel like going back and, you know, weaving it in. But um, I... I uh, I learn from them. What I learn, I think, when I'm writing more than anything else is that I've been storing the consequences of attention for a very long time and that the consequences of attention are there to be applied, exploited, whatever, at any time that you bring enough thinking to bear on them. I'm, I'm You know, Jack is told entirely from the point of view of a a, a man, you know, as with uh, Reverend Ames also. Um, of course, this is an extension of my imagination that comes from watching men, you know, and, and in understanding them as I can. Um, I, you know, I think that there, there's a great, you live almost a, a variety of lives um, by tr speculating to the best of your ability how someone really other than oneself uh, experiences and things and so on. It's very interesting to me. I can imagine. Uh, you mentioned once that as a child, a teacher told you, I'm going to quote you here, that you have to live with your mind your whole life. You build your mind so you make it into something you want to live with. And then you said, nobody has ever said anything more valuable to me. How did you build and furnish your own mind. And uh, based on your experience and what you've learned, uh, what construction methods and materials would you recommend to others? Well, for me, um, I was a bookish child, as I have mentioned in other contexts. Um, and I read 
uh, I was very systematic about writing, reading books that I knew were good. You know, I, people like Dickens and Mark Twain and so on. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson. Um, uh, and sometimes reading very far over my head, but nevertheless with the idea that I was giving myself something of value as a result of the effort. Um, I'm sure there are lots of ways that people could have taken that teacher's advice, but for me it was all books for a very long time. You mentioned old books. Um, I read that C.S. Lewis once tried to encourage readers to read an old book for every new one, but you've actually gone further and read, uh, from what I've read, almost exclusively old books. What, what prompted you to start that practice? Um, curiosity as much as anything. I, I did a PhD, you know, an ordinary English PhD, and I was assigned all sorts of things that, because they were assigned, perhaps didn't have the significance for me that they should have had. I've done a lot of rereading in subsequent years, but I, I'm always trying to put together what I find to be a credible model of the world, you know, and uh, which is no easy thing. But the major valuable questions that have come to me have usually come from the fact that I've studied something historically in a way that makes me question present accounts, question them very very deeply. I am betting that you are not only an avid reader, but probably an avid rereader, and would be curious what books you have reread the most. Oh, well, that, it's a strange list at this point. The, the books that I teach, of course, you know, Moby Dick and, and um, you know, the, the better novels of William Faulkner and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I know them in the way that a teacher knows books, but then there's also uh, Pierce Plowman, uh, which was written in the 14th century, you know, and uh, it's extremely strange and beautiful. And I, <laughs> I read it over and over again. It has so many markers in it this time, this, by this point that I can't distinguish, you know, what is the more or the less interesting thing that I've attempted to remember by putting a marker in. Mm -hmm. It's so human. It sounds so much like a human voice over all this time, over all this time. One that, switching a little bit to kind of broader questions. You've been writing um, a fair amount recently about uh, democracy, the common good, our common culture. And at one point you call democracy the logical and inevitable consequence of religious humanism. What do you see as the connection between the two? Well, I, you know, there are things that seem to me true because I reinforce them from other kinds of awareness or learning. And I'm, of course, very, very struck by the unique brilliance of, of a human being, mm -hmm. um, which is something that we tend uh, to, utterly to, to disparage, demean, you know, uh, utterly fail to notice. Mm -hmm. um, and I, by my understanding every person lives out a beautiful, complicated, uh, inaccessible to other con consciousnesses, sort of uh, parable of life. Mm -hmm. And and it is sacred. And uh, the intrusions or the deprivations that, uh, you know, refuse to acknowledge this, um, tend to take political forms of, you know, totalitarianism and so on. Um, democracy is so far and, and in any conceivable future, as far as I'm concerned, is the only way that we can possibly honor the fact of the brilliance, the importance of, of every human life, human awareness and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking back to a really remarkable interview you did with President Obama when he was still sitting president in 2015. And uh, the two of you talked about how um, what you saw as the basis of democracy being the willingness to assume well of other people. 
and you warmed against what you called the idea of the sinister other. And we are certainly in a period where there are media, social media, political ideological forces all intensifying tribalism and reinforcing the idea of a sinister other, uh, playing on apparent appetites that are already there for that kind of tribalism. How does one cultivate, both on a personal level and on a cultural level, an appetite for a, a truer and more charitable story? Well, you know, <clears throat> I, I think we have some obligation to support each other in this, you know, not simply, you know, materially, but um, to teach and to preach and to write, uh, to do these things that are the addresses of one sensibility to others uh, in a way that is respectful, that is generous in its assumptions about the mentality of the reader, you know. Um, I think a great deal, speaking as a former teacher of writers, there is a kind of a pervasively low opinion of the general public that means that what is fed to the general public as culture, as, as popular culture especially, is often uh, less worthy, less good than it would be possible for the same people who made that culture to produce if they proceeded more optimistically about what their, what their audience would accept and, and be engaged by. I think we can't, we can't descend horribly to one another. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's always a form of self-congratulation if you can think badly of other people, but it's very, very destructive. That's right. Well, Marilyn, it looks like we have lost your video, so we'll hope that that can come back on, but fortunately we can still hear you very clearly. And I wanted to ask <laughs> you um, about, um, you had coined a memorable phrase at one point in your work, Absence of Mind, uh, the hermeneutics of condescension, uh, which you mentioned as sort of describing the idea that earlier generations were somehow either intellectually or socially or morally beneath us. Where does this chronological snobbery come from? And what do you see as its antidote? Well, I think one of the major sources of it is that we teach history very badly or teach it hardly at all. You know, people don't, uh, you know, realize uh, that, you know, when Shakespeare was alive, he walked across a bridge that had human heads on pikes displayed there, you know, for the birds to eat, you know. Uh, the uh, very steep upgrade of civilization in terms of of many things uh, is, is a is to be recognized, is to be perpetuated, protected. Um, but people don't know enough about the past. They think they can, they idealize it. That's when people, you know, were right-minded and all the rest of it. Um, in fact, um, you know, it was savage in many ways. And, you know, we're, we're looking all the time now at slavery. But what that was is one of the major forms of brutality in, in, in the human past. And uh, we, we weed out the fact that there were people who, who hoped for something better and worked towards something better and risked their lives or spent their lives trying to, to improve things and, thank, frankly, improved them, you know. We could look to history for models about having things be better than they were, you know, the end of cruel and unusual punishment and so on. We don't do that. We simply obsess on the fact that things were worse and act as if we had some sort of, a, uh, you know, role in making making our lives very very much less grotesque. You know, um, it's we need models. We need to figure out what did reformers do when they created effective reforms and so on. Um, you have to look into the dark past to see that there were people in the dark past who were trying to make the world less dark. And the fact that, you know, for a while at any rate, you know, with any luck, 
we're able to enjoy a, a, by world standards and by historical standards a humane civilization uh, granting all its faults you know mm-hmm. that that was the work and thought of of nameable people nameable movements and and um, at this point we absolutely need examples of of humanizing influences that take hold and work and you know we're losing the sense of that so one of the um rather unusual things about the folks you read is that unlike many uh, modern contemporary writers you are a fan of john calvin jonathan edwards and the puritans and i wanted to ask what initiated your interest in calvin and edwards and sparked your interest and excitement over their work and thought. I really do think that the reason that I have more have so much more interest in Calvin than other people who speak about him is that I've actually read him. You know, that one of the things that's very irritating about the general conversation, no matter how how lofty it is in terms of its intellectual claims, uh, is that it's often based simply on some kind of word of mouth that passes down through the generations, you know. Um, the He's a beautiful writer, you know. <laughs> um, he is a beautiful thinker. I think that met much of the best, uh, you know, subsequent uh, philosophy, people like Descartes and so on, come straight out of Calvin. Um, the reason i mean i i was aware of jonathan edwards because i went to a <laughs> college in the northeast but also um i was assigned an essay of his when i was i think a sophomore down and uh there was a beautiful footnote in it talking about the fact that reality is is uh unaccountably recreated moment to moment comparing it to the effect of light. And um, that's, that was very important to me because everything else I was hearing, you know, Darwinism, behaviorism, all of these things, Freudianism, are different forms of, of, of a very unattractive determinism, you know. Um, that, you know, that the idea of, for example, conventional ideas of God that were made for him biblically, you know, that he was omnipotent and so on, um, they would be disallowed by these determinisms that, you know, that, that said basically we were not free to act. God was not free to act. It was all, all a, a sort of an organic mechanism, you know. Um, the, when I read that, note of Edwards, it gave me a, no, a new model of reality. And perfectly, you know, a, a physicist would say, you know, there's no way of accounting for the fact that reality recreates itself as itself moment to moment, or, you know, it's a much finer, uh, you know, unit of time than moment can, you know, evoke. Um, and I, I you know, he rescued me out of out of the deprivations of what is called modern thought, and I've been reading him in light of that sight ever since. That sight of his, um, and uh, he's a wonderful thinker. He's always called the greatest philosopher born on the North American continent, and he is. He deserves his reputation. So you noted once that one of the things that comes with a Calvinist outlook is that you are always posed to the question, what does God want from this particular situation? And I'd be curious how you go about engaging with and wrestling with that question uh, in the particulars of your own life. Well, you know, it's a it's a question that doesn't recur all the time in the same forms. You know, mm-hmm. um, you, you when you encounter someone, you know, you the idea is really that you look at them with the idea that they are sent to you by God with the, with the intention that you should react to them with the under, with that understanding. You know that 
in effect, the way Calvin describes it, they become God in effect because they are his emissaries, no matter who they are, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, the idea is to to understand the human situation in this profound way. What What would God want from this moment? And it's almost, you know, it is not that I should protect myself or that I should uh, prove that I'm more intelligent or richer or whatever than the person I'm encountering. You know that those are not the questions that, or the answers that God wants. The question is how to respond to the holiness and the what vulnerability or whatever um, is is presented to you in the presence of another person. There are also things like, you know, any moral question that you encounter in life, even things like avoiding waste and extravagance or, you know, taking reasonable care of your health or anything like that. These kinds of uh, questions, you know, what does God want of you? You know, it's a kind of a question that is applicable in, in you know, really any number of circumstances, all circumstances. Well, during this last half of our program, we're going to turn to questions from our viewers. So our first question comes from Mickey Jordan, who asks, do you believe that beauty is something we are simply struck with, or is beauty something like a capacity which we can grow in and hone? Oh, I think without any question, you can enhance your own uh, capacity for for seeing beauty or for, you know, uh, seeing the, the, the deeply implanted character that beauty has in the existence of things, you know. Mm-hmm. I always like the fact that mathematicians and scientists and so on call a theory beautiful if they think it's plausible and I think, or elegant, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that that's um, the kind of model that you can carry over into all kinds of perceptions of things. That's right. So Maddie Vinnerstrom asks, I'd love to know if Marilyn Robinson considers herself a regional writer and why she's drawn to the Midwest as a setting for her novels. Um, I I just can't, you know, the regional is a, is a hard category to describe. Proust is a regional writer, you know? I mean, almost any writer has some world who, you know, that, that you know, tactile, seasonal, and all these kinds of qualities um, are the sort of vocabulary of her or his imagination. Um, I have not, I, I do write about places that people perhaps don't ordinarily write about. Well, of course, that's true. But um, I have not had the feeling that I was by any means isolating myself from other readers, uh, other you know, people whose worlds are very different from that world. Um, you know, I mean, I really do think that Gilead probably has more in common with most people's experience than Proust's uh, France did, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or does or will. And uh, that's, I, I just don't really attach importance to the idea of regional writing. Thank you. So our next question comes from Frederick Richardson, who says, given the extreme concern about cultural appropriation today, what do you say to writers who want to write from the perspective of someone from a culture not their own? For example, a white man writing from the perspective of a black woman. Well, um, I think that uh, the appropriateness of that, (laughs) as opposed to the appropriation, but the if you do it well, I don't think anyone should object. Mm-hmm. If it, if you are full, you know, make a full use of your, your understanding, you do. You know, it's it's a it's a risk. Mm-hmm. You might seem insensitive. You might seem very ignorant. That, but that, in a way, is a risk that anybody takes writing fiction. You know, I don't think. Uh, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong in the effort to understand someone unlike oneself. I think that uh, actually we're supposed to do that. (laughs) 
and to be afraid of, of making the effort is it seems to me to be just to entrap us all in in a very narrow experience mm -hmm. I'm actually going to combine two different questions because they're quite similar and you can probably answer them together. Natalie Widows asks, how do you as a teacher and a writer cultivate in others an attention to an appreciation for the beauty of the world? And similarly, Seth Strickland asks, how would you or do you encourage your students to develop their intellectual lives in conjunction with or opposition to their academic lives? Um, I do certainly try to encourage them to develop their intellectual lives. Um, one of the reasons for that is that writers have to have a certain confidence. You know, uh, if, if they feel that they're just in a little corner of civilization, you know, writing, you know, intimidated by the idea of writing something that they don't know about or something like that and making themselves small, you know, um, that that's a, a plague among young writers. What they should be doing is uh, reading extremely ambitiously. Uh, it doesn't. It actually enables people to realize that they do understand, you know, the highest levels of their art, which they do. You know, um, I I uh, I think that most people want to write in the first place because in one way or another something has struck them as being probably simultaneously beautiful and unacknowledged. Mm -hmm. um, and people are often writing about what would appear to be obscure lives and so on, uh, making the statement that, yes, this was a life that occurred within very narrow limits, but yes, it was a beautiful, generous life. Um, you see that a lot with uh, students who whose parents immigrated, you know, and who think think that their parents are not perhaps properly understood until, you know, they've been given a world that other people can enter. So Fritz Heinzen asked a question that I'm sure many have wondered about. He asked, Mrs. Robinson, as someone whose work reflects such wide reading, we'd love to know who are some of the fiction and nonfiction authors, both past and present, that you would recommend to others. <laughs> I'm very bad. I think it's probably a black mark on my character that I'm really very bad at, at recommending. You know, I recommend Emerson, you know. Um, I... Uh, what can I say? I read a lot of theology. Um, not, but I have a, a very strong historical interest in the development of certain histor of theological traditions and so on. Um, and I always feel a little bit uh, intimidated by the idea of, I'm, you know, I mean, my interests are not everyone's interests. This is a thing I know well, but they're enormously nutritive and stimulating to me, you know. Um, I'm, it's, you know, it's a bizarre irony, but I am not a very well up on contemporary writing, even though some of the, you know, very interesting contemporary writers have been my students, people like Paul Harding and so on. Um, so I, what can I say? That's always a question that I dodge or I, I get embarrassingly candid about it, you know. <laughs> Uh, Henry Slavens asked one of the most popular or upvoted questions. He'd love to hear about your thoughts on the civil unrest we are experiencing now in America. I find it very encouraging, truly. I mean, all sorts of painful things have become obvious, you know, like the fact who knew that the president could send, you know, unmarked vans full of, you know, soldiers in effect into an unoffending American city. I mean, that's not like something you expect, but um, at the same time, uh, it's, a, it's like it goes against the grain of expectation in a way that makes people conscious of what they expect and want and demand, you know. Um, it, it's a perilous moment that we're in at the moment, but I, I have, uh, you know, the government itself seems to be in pretty bad shape. The the populace seems to be in pretty good shape. And um, I think that it 
we have a, a good possibility of having it all work out. <laughs> it's uh, I've never seen such crazy times in my life, but I do think that the balance is probably on the side of of a restoration of American democracy. May it be so. Um, so the next question comes from David Norman, and David asks, it would seem that beauty should be persuasive, but the current fad is tending towards intentional ugliness. Do you agree? And if so, what do you believe we can do to reverse it? I, yeah, I wonder, I mean, there are two things, you know, I mean, like with Walt Whitman, he would be writing about things that other people would have seen as ugly until he wrote about them. You know, mm -hmm. there's a way in which a good writer can look at an, an amazing a variety of things and discover a, a sort of unique capacity for beauty in in very, you know, anticip unanticipated places, which is a, a broadening of everyone's experience. It's that's a very good thing. Ugliness for its own sake. I imagine would be a project that would exhaust itself fairly quickly. But um, I mean, because there's oddly enough, there's just not that much ugliness. But if you, if you are a writer who is creating it, then that's a very arbitrary and I think a very negative thing to do. Um, although every writer's, you know, I, I believe in the legitimacy of every project if it's, you know, not totally corrupt in one way or another, but um, I, I don't, I mean, there's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of uh, refusal to acknowledge that people in general like to participate in what is interesting or what is beautiful. They like to engage art at that level. And it's like an insult or a conscious intentional deprivation to uh, to oppose that, to deny that. Um, I don't. I think that maybe, and this is just my, you know, feeling the gloom that I think that all of us feel from time to time. But I wonder what our civilization would have been like if every fiction weren't based on a murder. You know. I mean, I'm talking about television now and so on. If if um, every time you want to be sure the audience is with you, you don't kick somebody to death or whatever hideous thing is happening, you know. Um, people, I we've wanted to say that people don't take the models of their behavior from fiction, except when we think that they do. We're very inconsistent about that. Mm -hmm. But I kind of think that they do. And it's not that they are necessarily corrupted by seeing violence and viciousness all the time, but that not, they're not given anything else, you know? Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about condescending or sugarcoating or anything. I'm talking about the fact that there are other things besides homicide, you know? Mm -hmm. Indeed. So switching gears a little bit, this next question comes from Heidi Metcalf Little, who asks, can you speak about motherhood, how it changed you, and how the experience of that vocation impacted your writing and maybe even your experience with and observations of beauty? I really like, the whole motherhood thing is very pleasing to me. <laughs> um, you know, grandmotherhood now has come in come into play and so on. But um, I don't know. I mean, I always intended to have children. Then I had them. I enjoyed them. I think that there's probably nothing more interesting than watching language develop in someone, watching, mm -hmm. you know, memory and narrative and all kinds of things like that. Just, you know, ex nihilo, you know, emerge in these, in these fantastic little brains that, you know, are that are growing exponentially over, you know, months of time and so on. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I mean, children are really beautiful <laughs> and they're very satisfactory creatures in terms of, you know, um, the kind of intimacy that you have with them, the fact that they tell you what they're afraid of and all that sort of thing. Um, I, I mean, I, 
if I had to choose between every other aspect of my life or being a mother, <laughs> I would be a mother. I just loved it. I've always loved it. That's lovely. Uh, Jennifer Spiegel asks, what challenges do you find as a Christian and as a writer who writes in the secular world? You know, I have found absolutely no problem with that. Zero. I think one of the strangest things that happens is that that many people who consider themselves Christians consider themselves, you know, strangers in the world in the sense that, you know, if people found out what they really thought or believed, they would be ridiculed or something like that, you know. Um, I made the test. I've been very forthright. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I have been as gently and fairly read and reviewed as any writer that I know. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't, you know, that's part of what bothers me. We, We entertain these very negative assumptions about people in general. And um, and and actually, re- people restrict their own work, their own imaginations, because they're afraid. If, you know, people, Christian people, say to me, "Weren't you afraid about writing about a minister or something like that?" No, <laughs> I'm not going to choose what I write about on the basis of some imagined fear. You know. Mm-hmm. And if my book had been, you know, tanned and ridiculed and I'd been, you know, tarred and feathered or something like that, you know, that's just the chance you take when you write a book. Um, but I, 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 there's something very, very wrong when so many people who claim to be religious people act as if they have to, you know, hide out, uh, as if they're, you know, they're understanding of things and so on couldn't support daylight Mm -hmm. that's just appalling to me that's a great word actually our next question is also on fear comes from jennifer frey and she asks you write about fear and claim that it's not a christian habit of mine what do you have to say about our current climate of fear how does a christian respond to the fears around the pandemic and civil unrest well you know (laughs) we're just you know, we're just living in a kind of a condensed form human life, you know. I mean, people have always had to deal with pandemic or plague or whatever. Mm-hmm. People have always dealt with unrest. We're not habituated to it because we've been very fortunate, you know. But that doesn't mean that we're exempt from what people have lived through time out of mind. I don't you know, I think we make a little appeal to our own sense of dignity to keep, you know, the anxieties that we have in perspective, which is not to say that they're easily solved. It's simply to say all generations have dealt with difficulty. We didn't have a special past that will exclude us from it. And what we have to do is make the best of it. Mm-hmm. Callie Walker asks, you've talked and written about there being a, quote, visionary quality to all experience, end quote. And that experience means something because it's being addressed to you. Can you speak more about this? Well, you know, that's one of the ways in which I think I'm probably most Calvinist or most Puritan. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, they, they took it to be true that God addresses everyone individually, that he he addresses you circumstantially, you know, this is your problem to solve. This is your answer to give. This is your, and uh, the, <clears throat> the thing that, you know, that, that makes uh, life extremely interesting because you assume that there's meaning over and above, you know, the, the mere basic material sort of meaning of things, you know. Um, and it assumes that there is a kind of a pervasive sacred expectation in reality. Um, and, you know, I mean, every theology is incomplete. Every theology, you know, emphasizes some things to the, at the cost of other things. And I don't, and, and my own religious culture is not dogmatic in any way. But it gives you ways to think about things, gives you ways to encounter without 
differentiating more and less important, more more or less desirable, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I I find that to be very beautiful, very you know engaging. Mm-hmm. So Heather Buller asks, especially in the face of sharp cultural disagreement on so, both on social media and in real life, how do we cultivate our minds and hearts to see the truer and more charitable story of individuals and not the sinister other? Well, I think that people basically have to to fall back on their own resources, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, It's one of the reasons that I wish that we would talk about people who have done well in other generations Mm -hmm. uh, and and not, you know, uh, assume that because they coexisted with things that were flagrantly evil, they themselves must have tolerated evil. We know from our own experience that what you would choose to live with, what you would choose to see done around you is not necessarily something that you determine or, you know, it can have any impact on or much impact. But um, I think you have to, you know, talk to yourself, think through things, attempt, you know, the imaginative extensions of compassion and and uh, circumstance, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be nice if there were some solution that we could fall back on, but we're not offering ourselves good solutions these days. There's, people are so enthralled by contentiousness that anything virtually can become a, a storm of contentiousness. And um, with anger and with contempt and all these things. Um, and, you know, the excitement carries the behavior away from what was really the issue in the first place. It destroys the possibility of a conversation, you know. And and uh, when you when you are invited into one of these micro storms, it seems to me that uh, you could say no. Actually, I have to go read a good book, you know, um, because we're not doing it ourselves any good with these this habit of antagonistic controversy. It it just is not fruitful. Well, our time is rapidly dwindling, but. Um, I- Final question that comes from Emily Billings actually picks up on that very theme that you're talking about with habits. And Emily asks, what habits do you implement in your everyday life to keep you healthy and spiritually grounded? <laughs> um, you know, it's it's uh, been true of me, I think, my whole life that the main thing I wanted was control of my own time, mm-hmm. and which I certainly have now, <laughs> the combined effect of retirement and isolation and all the rest of it. But um I don't I don't regiment myself at all really. It's kind of shocking. I I try to remember to have three meals a day, you know. I I have a basic sense of direction as far as what I'm working on, studying for and so on. Um I've I've been very fortunate in the degree to which I've been able to structure my own life. Um, I think that's the thing. You can make the trade of sort of selling your time to somebody uh, who will make you prosperous, you know, or you can keep your time and be a little less prosperous, except in the fact of, uh, you know, being able to do the work that you're called into the world to do. Well, thank you, Marilyn. And thank you to all of you who have joined us. I'd love to give the final word to Marilyn as we close out. Marilyn. Well, um, I think, I mean, I don't know. Final word sounds kind of dramatic. But I do think it's true that one of the things that is interesting about the human situation is that we do have a sort of unlimited um, capacity for generosity that whatever you do if you do it well it's an act of generosity toward everybody anybody who might who who would feel the benefit of your generosity and that means any work that you do at all it certainly means any artistic work that you do Um, we have you know we have that capacity to create society around us 
by acts of generosity towards the society. Um, and uh, of course, the repayment of, of that sort of uh, choice is very clear. You know, you can make the society you want to live in. Um, for many people, this is not a tolerable <laughs> model because they don't like the idea of giving something up, even in the possibility of having it returned, you know, like the bread upon the waters. Um, nevertheless, if you accept a discipline of generosity in every circumstance where the word could come up, um, whether it, it's generosity of imagination, uh, generosity of seriousness, actually putting good thought into everything that you do and so on. That's my advice. That's what everybody ought to do. Ah. Marilyn, thank you so much. It has been a delight to talk with you today. <laughs> yes, very nice to talk with you. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Have a great day.